weakness in all teams. So we're going to kick over now. Um, folks, we're going to give folks a few moments to uh, to join us, but I want to welcome all those that are coming in. And, and I will formally introduce you to myself and Dan, depending on how you arrive to us in a few moments. But um, let's just give folks a few minutes to uh, to get started. We need that elevator hold music. We do. We need that something to just keep everybody a little happy, do, right? Do, 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 do. Please hold. You were doing that wonderfully. Wonderfully. <laughs> Actually, one of my favorite episodes from Cheers had that in it. See, we were just talking about Boston and you went right into the Cheers episode. I mean, well, what better? What better? I mean, when coach when coach tells somebody on the phone, he wait, let me check, and then he and then he makes a clicking sound and starts singing into it, and they ask him what he's doing, and he's trying to class up the joint. I just felt that was you know that works. It was that moment. Awesome. All right, Dan. Well, hey, we you know I want to be mindful of folks that have been able to join us uh, time at this stage. We should probably kick things off. Um, I'm sure they don't care about what we think about chairs. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, you know, first I want to welcome everybody that's joining us today. Uh, you know, really excited to have uh, Dan join me today for this VCIO Toolbox Learning Series. If you're new to our learning series, as we uh, uh, try to do, we bring in somebody from outside the spectrum of VCIO world to come in and share ways that you can either build your MSP, improve upon your MSP, or improve upon a process that your MSP might be leveraging. Most importantly, I bring people in that uh, can talk better than I about subjects that I wish I knew more about. So uh, today, my, my you know a good friend and somebody that's become a bit of a mentor from a leadership perspective to me over the last year that I've gotten to know him. I have uh, Dan Adams joining us today. And Dan, I won't be able to do your resume um, as much justice as you can. So why don't you tell folks a little bit about your background and, you know, how you work, fit into the world of MSP and what you're doing today? Well, very kind intro. And and yeah, can't, it's going to be hard to live up to that. Um, I've, uh, I started back in the 80s, actually, in the IT services world. I started a small IT software company called Novell. And I was on the original team that put Max on to PC networks and have been in, in the industry since then. So prior internet, prior mouse and GUI interface, you know, up till where we are now and uh, started an MSP uh, in the early 90s and still own the MSP, but I've worked my way out of every position there. So I'm, I'm now just the chairman um, and uh, I'm no longer involved in the day to day. So I've had every position and probably just about all the experiences you can have as a, in, in the MSP game. Awesome. You know, I mean, I think what's critical here is as we talk about some of these, it comes from the experiences you had as an MSP, right? I, you know, I think it's always important that as we talk to leaders, you know, Every business is sort of the same, but yet they're all different. <laughs> and I think that could be said about the MSP community. You know, we've got, you know, while, you know, overall we all manage P&Ls, we've got sales teams, we're trying to get to market and do acquisition. We have all those nuances that live in the world of MSP. Truly we're servants, right, to the customers that we serve. And that brings a little bit of a different dynamic, sometimes a high stress dynamic, right? So when we get into that conversation about culture, I think it's critical there. And I think it's important for folks to know that, uh, you know, what you're sh about to share with us comes from experience and I'm sure a few scars on your back. And uh, yeah, I'd like to limit it to my back. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's sometimes pressure. No, this is pressure, right? It's, it's constant pressure and it's managing pressure and you're managing the pressure the clients are putting on you, the pressure that your employees are putting on you and then the pressure you're putting on yourself um, plus vendors and the industry and change. So yeah, this is about managing pressure. Yeah, um, no doubt. I mean, technology does not discriminate, right? <laughs> it's amazing how it can be a, a beautiful day and then all of a sudden something that goes wrong universally in the world of technology that can yeah. change the course of that afternoon, right? Any, any, any given moment is a surprise and we all have that fear of looking at our phone and it being the bomb blowing up and, and what are we going to have to deal with next, right? Well, if you're okay, are we ready? Should we jump into some things? Yeah, let's jump in and, and get started. 
So what we're going to do here is, is this presentation that I'm going to share a little bit today. And, and this is a bit of a conversation too, though. It's not just about me uh, sharing this, but having worked with so many MSPs and, and been around here so long, there, there's, there's a correlate. There, we're very aware of the term culture. And I see that there's a correlation between um, the ones that get culture right and high performance and the ones who are aware of culture and not go anywhere. So I kind of want to talk about some of those things, if that's okay, and see if we can't shed some light and 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 help some people along this on this journey we're in. So um, I guess the first question is, is, is do we all believe that culture is important? Um, and, and Brian, I've seen you nod. We've talked about it. It's something that, that I think you'd agree. Uh, am I right on that? Yeah, I mean, look, if you've got a bad culture, it leads to a lot of different challenges, right? Employee right. retention being the biggest one, consistency and delivery to your customer because you have that employee retention problem. And you know what? Nobody just likes to be around toxic cultures or toxic people, there's, right? So, there's there's know. no question. Um, I'm involved with a very large peer group, and we did a survey of over a thousand owners, managers, and employees. And one of the top things that's on everybody's mind is culture. I think there's no question that culture is important. Um, but what I want to address is some of the confusion um, that is around this and how it hurts us. Um, there's been many quotes, uh, our consultants in the industry, even outside the industry, really push the importance of culture. And I've got a couple of quotes to just share with you here, you hear, right? So cult, company culture is the backbone of any successful organization. So a very, uh, there's, there's no question about that. Another one that I found interesting, and we all quote Simon Sinek, or we like Simon Sinek, um, but he talks about how corporate culture matters, right? And how we choose to treat our people impacts everything. And one of the most popular ones you hear, and, and maybe I'm an old timer, you would probably nod at this one too. Sorry to throw you in that same age bucket there, it's Brian. It's all good. But, but one of the first quotes I remember hearing about culture was Peter Drucker, who was a very foundational consultant uh, for many, many years saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I, I don't think there's any question that culture is extremely important, but then this gets me to then this question of a culture of what? If you spend any time with me or you hear me speak or you go through any of my media, anything that is confusing and nebulous and not clear, I tend to really aggressively challenge because culture in itself does not define anything. We can have a culture of laziness. We can have a culture of do the least possible, right? A culture of apathy. Um, it's it, it's really by itself doesn't help us. But unfortunately, it's one of those things where if you ask anybody what good culture is or what bad culture is, we may have some some areas that overlap, but each of us have our own interpretation. And that causes problems. I find that small businesses have a hard time when it comes to the concept of accountability, but accountability is and can be part of a successful culture. I think there's a happy balance too, right? People want to hold people accountable, but you don't want to fall into a culture of micromanagement because people tend to not respond to that either, right? It, so, yeah. you know, getting people to, you know, empowering people in a proper way and building a culture of empowerment can drive accountability possibly without that micromanagement. But I'd be interested to hear how you're going to approach this. So, so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit because, because you're right. I mean, there's an interpretation that you just kind of shared of, well, well, strong Strong accountability might mean micromanagement, and that's how some people might interpret accountability in, in that culture, but that's definitely not, a, not necessary. Um, in clarifying culture, the first thing I'll throw out is often I'll see company values of like we've got a company culture or a value of, of customer service, or we'll have a value of creativity or, or, or work hard. And the problem you have with those is even by saying those, there's so much leeway for interpretation on what that means. It doesn't give you as a leadership team strength 
to help push something forward and avoid the things that cause a problem. In fact, one thing I'll share is in, in my company, we wanted everyone to know that we are all responsible for each other. We need to take care of each other. We need to set each other up for success, that it's not a selfish endeavor, that we need to, we need to take ownership of each other's success. And so we had the value of, I take responsibility for your success. And the intent there was, is okay, if you fail, I fail. And I need to do everything I can to set you up for success or I haven't done my part. It's interesting though, is in our organization, there crept in a sub interpretation of this is where I take responsibility for your success meant I take credit for your work. <laughs> and and that is furthest from the truth would it be. So I will say, even if you try and define clearer and clearer what exactly your your values and what your culture, what you represent, what you represent, you have to really go that extra mile because some people will twist even stuff that you think is clear. You can't leave it open. Um, most of us in small companies, the culture and the values are defined one of two ways. One is the leadership team will get together and they will say, okay, what do I like or what do I value? And what are my traits, right? I'm, I'm creative, I'm hardworking, I'm, you know, I'm serve the client and whatever. And they list out the things that they feel are, and that's kind of the, the start of, of one branch. The other branch um, is leaders or those involved will kind of look about the organization, what they want to become and where they're going, and then think about what are the things culturally or value wise they're going to help them get there. So you've got A, who am I now? What do I really think about? You know, what, what do I think is important? Or where are we going and what is it going to take to get there? And I think that's one of the toughest things for leaders, especially new leaders that are just starting up and starting out, having that vision beyond their core personal values and being able to translate that into something scalable can really be challenging, both because you don't have the crystal ball to see what the future is going to really mean for you, yes. but also you may have only been exposed to so much, which made your personal core you know, values, what they are. <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily mean that's everything your company's going to need, right? So it's it's yeah. pretty interesting, this concept of culture, because it means a lot of different things to different people. Now, you haven't seen the things I was going to present, mm -hmm. but you led right into this. And this is, you know, the, the yin-yang. The culture can be, it's a two-sided sword, right? It, if it's aligned with where you're trying to go, it's wonderful. If it's not aligned where you're trying to go, then it starts to cut into you and cause problems. And like you said, sometimes you can start here and you think this is the center of what matters, but it's not aligned with where you want to go and it's starting to hurt. In fact, that's what I believe Peter Drucker was saying when he said about culture eating strategy for breakfast, meaning we can have the best vision, we can have the best strategy how we're going to achieve it, but if how we act and what we value isn't aligned with what that strategy is, it doesn't matter who we are, who we value, what we value, what we want to do is going to win almost every single time. Yeah. And I'd come from the point of you can't execute a strategy without buy-in and buy-in comes from having a culture that, it, you know, is confident enough in leadership to go, yes, I want to follow the road on that strategy. It, and, and, you know, it's interesting uh, to, to add to that, I've seen people buy in emotionally. Yes, we want to grow. Yes, we want to deliver a higher customer experience. Yes, we want to create more margin, right? But what that really translates to is the actions they're going to have to take. They don't want to take the actions because it doesn't align with who they really are and what they hold. So we can say we believe and want something, but if our actions don't really draw us to it, then we've got this problem. And I've seen so I've left so many meetings where you've talked about a concept and everybody <laughs> nods and they say, yeah, we want that. We want that. But the price you need to pay or the actions that need to change to get there, they're not willing to do it. And I used to take offense to it, Brian. Yep. But, 
And I used to think, well, they're just lying to us. They're nodding in the meetings that if they had a problem, they would say something. But often, I don't think people even realize I want what's behind door number two, but they don't realize what the real steps take to do it. So they're committing to it without committing to what it's going to take to do it. It's like losing weight, right? It, it, or exercise or any of those things. It's like, wait, oh, I have to change. I'm not sure. You know, I think that what you're bringing out there is a great point, because I think what we forget sometimes is leaders driving, hopefully, culture and driving some of this strategy that we're sharing with our clients. I mean, excuse me, saying sharing with our employees is, hey, these guys are not all like us. Me, And I don't mean that like there's an us versus them kind of thing, but some people choose to go to work. Some people choose to create work. It's just the way the world operates. And if we had all A players, we would never get anything done. So when you look at it, it's how do you interpret for them the steps that are going to take be needed to take to drive it? And how do you do that in a way that takes time with culture? I think a lot of people want to turn culture in a month. And culture is a long-term process to really get one established and adhered to and where yeah. employees are pu pushing it out, not the leaders. And, 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 and so that's an interesting thing that we talk about. And in defining culture, you've got to protect the culture, right, if you will. Um, and I've seen culture change. You can talk about it, but it's generally it takes a couple of years to change the actual culture top to bottom of the organization. And there's a lot of turnover. So let's say we want to deliver a higher result and we want to be more accountable and stuff like that. You just may have people there that just really don't value it. And there's nothing you can do to convince them to change. And you're going to have to quote, protect it. You're going to have to drive it. You're going to have to believe in it for a leader. This is a painful spot, Brian, because this is a spot where let's say you believe and know that accountability uh, is important, but your team really doesn't want to be held accountable. And you love these people. These are these are your, your brothers and sisters in arms. You've bled together. And so you have to at some point weigh out what's more important, the status quo and keeping this group of people, quote, happy, or what you want to become and what you want to do. And this is a hard spot. Leaders don't want to give up you know, what I have here for, for this, even if it's better sometimes. Yeah. Uh, when I talk about, or you share about this, and, and we're talking about the, the culture side of it, the culture needs to be something that you're willing to protect. And what part of what I alluded to is if this means so much to you, that means you're going to have to make decisions here at that bottom spot that you might not want to make. It's like, I'm going to have to make a change, or I'm going to have to hold Charlie accountable to what he said he was going uh, to do. And that's an uncomfortable spot. So if we talk about culture and we're not willing to defend it, to focus on it, then it, then it really our culture is not here. Our culture is more of acceptance and apathy than it is of what we're trying to do. And we can say this, but if we're not acting it, if we're not defending it, then in truth, that's really not our culture. That's just a no. word. And really, you were touching upon it right there with some of the hard decisions that leaders are going to have to make in order to maintain that culture, especially early on. Right. If you've got that engineer who is critical, at least to you today, but yeah. has that technician attitude that can sometimes be there of an air superiority that doesn't align up with that, you know, the way every other person is operating within your business. It's tough to, t to exit those people because you have the need. But I think the reality is when you see what the cost is and when you start understanding what yeah. the cost of having people that aren't on the bus really is it becomes much easier to move them out but again that only comes with time and experience as well yeah we could have a full session on that and that fear of losing that person you're afraid to lose yep. uh, i think we've all had that but as a business grows we almost always lose that key person you know several times in the journey and you start learning that that key person may not have as much weight on your success in fact they might be holding you back far more than you're willing to admit or recognize and i've got countless stories in that category um, but let's, let's now shift this to, let's shift this now to more performance because we've talked yeah. about culture. Now let's talk about kind of leveraging this into something that you might be able to take home and gain some, some value from, um, because, you know, you can't have consistent, great performance without accountability and you cannot have accountability without that being kind of a core part of your culture. So let's talk about driving that through. This is a grid that, um, 
comes up often in management side where you're where you're kind of evaluating your team members based upon their technical skills on one axis and then how well they fit right do they fit how you do business do they fit your culture what you're trying to do and the ones that fit really high in your culture and are really strong technical kind of your a players and then those that are down a little bit but still very solid in both areas are your b players and then you've got your people that are really good technical, like you were just talking about, Brian, but they're not quite a fit on some of the stuff you're doing. They're your C players. Or, you know, maybe it's they're they're really good company fit, but they're not so great technically. But you you put up with those. And then obviously you've got those who aren't great in either areas, and you probably wouldn't hire again if you had the choice. Um and this is pretty much we can put our people in the in this grid at some point to kind of understand them. Now, we love our A's and B's. Our C's frustrate us because sometimes they contribute at a high level and sometimes they do things that make us scratch our head. And we <laughs> wish, and we, we just don't get it. Well, hey, yesterday you were you were doing phenomenal. Today you're not, I, I don't know what to expect um, from you. But this leads me to the next question. Can you have an org chart of just A's and B's in the company? And there's not enough A's and B's out there is what I've found, right? We're searching for, we're searching for them. But in truth, you've got to be able to scale your company and draw from a larger talent pool. So we have to figure out how to move beyond a company that is dependent on just A's and B's to succeed. The other thing you got to keep in mind as you're, you're building this matrix of, of staffing mix too not all jobs comprise A or B needs too. Yes. So when you bring an A or B person into a job that might be more day-to-day -day tactical and, and you know, that they're going to get bored quickly. They're not going to get there. So you got to evaluate, you know, that person's need for knowledge, maybe, and, you know, maybe yeah. that's the best way to look at it. And, and, and clarity wise too. I mean, you can have A's and B's respective to the roles, Right. You can have a service desk level one person who who who's an A. They wouldn't be an A in, a, in, the, in the entire organization, but in their respective role, they're an A. Right. Yep. Is how they do that in our company. Let's go back to our company org chart and one of the metaphors. And you, you kind of alluded. It's almost like you 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 wrote this for me, Brian, because you've talked about you some of these things. But we like to use the term the bus and we, we talk about this a lot. And there's three or four phrases that we say all the time about the corporate bus. And that is, is when it comes to the bus, we've got to get the right people on the bus, right? We also say you got to get the right or the wrong people off the bus. And the third thing that we say a lot is get the right people in the right seats on the bus. Now, I have an extreme problem with the bus metaphor. And the reason being is on the bus, Brian, how many people actually have control where the bus is going and when it stops and how fast is it getting there? Only one. And you just answered my question about destination in the same process. <laughs> so, so, so this to me is, I mean, if this is the case, people are in the back of the bus, they're complaining they didn't get a window seat. They're sitting too close to the bathroom. They're complaining, are we there yet? I do not want a team full of people riding, expecting me to carry everybody. And a lot of small companies, this is the case. All the weight's on the owner. They don't realize that the weight is on them. So the thing I want to challenge here is to leverage a different metaphor when it comes to your company and your organization. And that is, we're going to use a Chinese dragon boat. And on a Chinese dragon boat, there is not a position that does not have direct effort and contribution to the success of the whole boat. And in fact, each spot I've learned that you have people there, some are your strength rowers, some are your endurance, some are your heart, some are your character, and they have respective areas that you put them on the boat. And everybody is driving, digging in to give effort to get it to where it needs to go. Now, there's one person though, in this picture that isn't rowing. And when you focus in on it, 
you see that they've they've allowed a musician on the dinner cruise, right? We've, we've got a musician. In fact, some people argue it's a drummer and it's not a musician, but that's an argument for a different hey, day. Look, there's entertainment and I like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> but on a boat where weight matters and he doesn't look like a small drummer and that drum doesn't look small. In fact, he and that drum look like they, they're more weight than the first set of rowers easily, <laughs> right? Weight matters. So why do we have on a boat that's about racing and everything counts, why do we have a drummer? And I was like, are you posing that to me? No. <laughs> yeah, you're, well, you're welcome to answer, right? No, you know what? I'm going to hold off. I'm going to give you the opportunity to give us your insight into it. And then we'll see if it aligns where, we're at, where yeah, I was you, going. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong is how it that's goes. That's it. Right? Look, in this boat, that drummer is setting the cadence and the tempo right? They're setting the, the row. Now, it's funny. Everybody on the boat's motivated. You could say, hey, between point A and point B, we want to win, right? And everybody could nod. And we could give them the math. Hey, you're probably going to have to do 300 strokes. So just get those 300 strokes in between point A and B and we'll be good. But they don't. So there's a cadence. There's a rhythm. And this is critical. This is your accountability culture. It's holding people accountable. Now, the interesting thing is, is when that drum strikes, it's not just everybody, you should have done a stroke between drum stroke one and drum stroke two. It is actually about exactly where you're supposed to be in unison, visual unison, because if you're out of place, you're going to knock the oar out of somebody else's hand. You're going to cause problems. You need to have a culture of accountability that's visible and clear and continuous to drive high performance. Because if you don't do that, people take strokes off, people do things randomly, and performance is not going to be as high. And the funny part is, and that and that was, you know, so you're hitting upon everything I thought you were going to get to in, in more, of course. But really, when I looked at this from the beginning, it was, it's the concept of synchronicity. You're getting the entire team to work together in a fashion. There's a leader, of course, here, the, the drummer setting that tempo, but everybody knows what the objective is. You're not doing just 300 strokes during the course of this. It's I need to be on stroke with my with the others. We all need to be working in that you know kind of uniform fashion to get to the other side as fast as we can and potentially win this challenge, right? So... You know, I love that picture as an analogy because I struggle with the bus concept as well, right? You hear it all the time and I'm guilty of using it as an analogy probably more than I should. But when people get on the bus, they really are passengers. Here, they need to be active performers. And that's really what you're trying to build in the culture is people understanding what their role and responsibility is, how it impacts others if they don't do the work they do. So yeah. each day they set out and get it done. And I, and I love this. There's a clarity on what success is with each drum stroke and where you're at. It's not interpretation. This is what we do, right? In a professional services organization, our success is tied to capturing the hours of all of our people and converting it consistently into value that the company can appreciate. It's not just spending the hours. It's not paying for the hours. It's, it's not hoping that some of the hours provide value to the company. The better performing companies consistently capture more of those hours than the lower performers. And that's the big delta. So that drum beat, everybody understanding exactly, having it visible, having it audible, so everyone can tell is a critical part of culture. Now you can call that micromanaging, but really that's the rhythm. That's, that's the rhythm we're following. It's not sporadic, it's not random. And that's what success requires. Awesome. Now, yeah. There's an interesting thing that happens. Now, let's take this back to your group of people. Let's talk about what happens to a D player when there's a constant, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how we follow up. This is how we track. This is how we enter our time. This is what we do. It pushes your D people out because they don't want to be accountable. They're not very good technically, and they get out. And that's an advantage to you. You don't want the Ds. You are carrying the Ds. Now, what does it do to your C players? Your C players are strong in one area and just lacking a little bit, but they want to be team players. Them seeing that cadence, feeling that cadence, feeling that stuff raises them up so they're consistent. Now, 
Do B players benefit? Because they're already kind of working. Yes, they do. Because I don't know if you've noticed this. B players get really frustrated when they see the C's and D's getting away with it. Yes. <laughs> they get really cranky. They get verbal. In fact, some of them will become C's or even D's themselves because why should I work? Because, you know, Charlie's not doing it, right? And so nobody's B's, getting on Charlie about it. Right. So B's love it too because now they feel good about what they're doing. Now, the question I get in the, in, in the conversation I'll get into is what about A's? <laughs> Because A's are just going to do it anyway. And do we? does A need a, a tempo and a cadence? And isn't it slowing them down maybe? Here's the interesting thing I found about A's. If you do not give A's a tempo and a cadence in the management, they kind of tend to go off on their own way sometimes, a lot of the time. And they do things that are beneficial, but sometimes not as beneficial as they think and they hope. It helps them be more focused and be more successful. So the cadence helps you at every level in your organization. It just. That's awesome. Cause I, it is so true, right? The A's tend to be a personality type that they know what they need to accomplish and they know what they need to get done, but given rope or given time or given, you know, the, the latitude to make decisions might start exploring things that are a little bit more self-fulfilling <laughs> and not as much, you know, for the organization. Now that doesn't, that's not a full negative because we want our A players, the ability to explore to a degree because it usually comes around and benefits us in a different fashion. But if it's too far out of the box, then we, then it's tough to harness and it's tough to get them back if they find too much interest quite candidly. Right. Right. They, they can, a, a client can pull them a different direction. They can personally go a different direction. There's multiple reasons why it can happen. The problem you'll find though, is if you're the leader and you're setting standards and vision, you'll get to a point, once you get to about 10, 15 employees, you start realizing that you don't want people pulling you the wrong direction. So even if it quote, could come back, it's not where you need that focus going. And you, as, you, as you scale and you become bigger and bigger, you'll find that you really need to channel those A's. You, you need to channel them and put it into areas that are contributing because every change, every variation, you as a business have to pay with extra effort and, and to try and get it involved. So I have a strong advocate to trying to get everyone going the right direction as, as, as often as possible. Um, I think that's great, too, because most MSPs do not have the financial means to just have somebody that is the chief of innovation that can just go run and explore all day long. You so can't we got to keep them reined in. You can't afford that. And we could talk for hours and I and, you know, and we're not going to. We don't have time and I don't want people falling asleep on us. But that's I I've got stuff on that area, too. That's a, that's a big one. Right. So what. What the, the the error that I used to make all the time, and I'm, I'm actually going to skip a slide and get to mistakes and solutions for us here, is um, when you are managing or you are leading, sometimes we have a tendency to let that be the result. What do you do? I manage, right? And manage by itself doesn't add value. I need to manage to a result, because all I'm doing is managing to waste time unless I manage to a result. A manager has a responsibility for to take their team and deliver a gross margin back to the company. That's what their job is. And anything beyond that is not delivering the number one role of their position. So I, Dan, would wouldn't prepare for meetings at times. I, Dan, wouldn't focus on the result of what my position needed to deliver, I would kind of get caught in busy work and, you know, managing people and talking things. This is a big sin. Do not just quote manage, make sure you know what the result is and your efforts are driving to achieve that result, which ties to accountability, which ties to raised performance. Okay. The next, Oh, I clicked the wrong button. My mistake. Your management and measurement needs to be visible, just like that drum stroke, audible, clear, consistent. This is what we do. This is how we do it. Every time, every day, we're driving that. It cannot be random. I, Dan, also another one of my sins. I wasn't consistent a lot of the time. And so what would happen is I would have a spasm of management or a spasm of accountability and structure, and then I'd wander off. 
And then I come back and my poor people were like, wait, this was important. Wait, he's not here. I guess it's not. Wait, this is important. They see it as you change in your mind. And really what it, it, it's, it's you've just got to be consistent. You got to drive it. And the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll add here is if you have a leader in an area and they're not strong on it, if they're not great on, on their time or focusing on better utilization, chances are they're not going to magnify that in their group. As I was sharing with you my weaknesses, my teams would would magnify what I was good at and unfortunately what I was really bad at. So if you're not driving accountability and it's not visible and you're not pushing it through on a consistent basis, then chances are if you're going to lead a team, you're not going to be good at it. You're going to you're going to be just as bad, but it's going to be multiplied with everybody in the organization. So as far as mistakes and culture and to tie that all together. Accountability has got to be key to your culture and you have to drive it. It has to be a cadence and you have to be meaningful and purposeful about what you do to produce that result. And if somebody's kind of not good at it, they're not going to all of a sudden become great because they're a manager. It's something you're going to have to work with yeah. them to make sure they deliver. And these are skills that are not necessarily easy to both see in yourself and make sure that you're executing on, right? Managing with the result needs to have a clear top-down approach to what the result expectations are. And sometimes those can be a little fuzzy in, an, in an, a mid-stage MSP where the managers are just getting their footing. Some of them are technical resources getting their first step up and they don't know what their result's supposed to be, right? So, you know, as in that culture setting, I think people need to feel comfortable and to get that effectiveness out of it in asking questions and asking what can we do better. I'm a big fan of not so much 360 reviews from that personnel perspective, but just those moments where, you know, I used to sit there, especially when I was in a hired gun role. So I did have some other people I was reporting, you know, into, or at least yeah. peer wise, Hey, let's get together. Am I hitting the right spots for you? Do you feel there's more my team should be doing? Am I hitting that? that? Cause I want to make sure I'm taking the top down to my team and, and spreading the right message and not just my interpretation of the message. And, you know, those things all foster, because what is culture at the end of the day? It really becomes, am I frustrated or am I not? If I'm frustrated, like I'm going to perceive the culture as being bad. If I'm not frustrated, it means I'm hearing what I need to hear to get my job done. Doesn't mean I agree with all of it all the time, right? But I'm mm -hmm. hearing what I hear to get it done. And I understand what it is. And I can share with others what they need to be doing in a free and open exchange at that point. It's 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 interesting. I think to to kind of take what you had and, and 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 put a little to the side of it is if we look at sports, sports always is a great analogy. analogy, always a great way. And I use sports a lot when you look at culture and you see teams that have a culture of winning, and you see it teams that have a culture of getting by, and you kind of have to find the company that aligns with who you are. Do you like to be? on that winning team or it's consistently winning, or are you kind of a get by player? I'm not saying there's a right or wrong here. The frustration comes is when you're on a dragon boat where everybody here gives a damn and wants to win versus one that's like, hey, you know what? I'm kind of tanning as well as, a, as, as exercising and it's just kind of a hobby. You've got to get on the right team that does what you want. That's part of the whole culture game for me and the leadership cannot be shy about, look, success doesn't happen randomly. Success comes from doing specific things again and again and again, consistently. And that's part of, that's what we do here, or we're kind of a get by group. And you need to make a decision as a leader, who you are and what you're going to push. And that repetition is so true because staying on the sports analogy, there's a reason why professionals are still practicing every week. They know their craft. They have the skills, but they need to now marry it up with the game plan for that given moment, for that next, you know, that next thing that they're trying to conquest. Obviously, the team they play that week. Yes. And it is amazing how people will also accept culture that might be a little different to their own you know, personal beliefs, if that culture is one of winning, you know, I'm not a big fan of the Patriots, but I'll throw it out there the Patriot way. <laughs> Everybody knows what the Patriot way was, and it was effective and how it works. But you talked to a lot of guys post career going, that was some of the toughest years I ever played, because it really didn't line up with my core values. But I saw if I did it, I would get the ring, right? You know, and that was the win. It's funny you say that. 
some of the, the greatest bosses I've found are not your ones that your buddy. The greatest yeah. boss that sees that you have the ability and pushes you to ele- pushes you to more of your potential. Now the question is, is this, is my culture, if I'm a little lazy, is that what I'm about? Or is my culture potentially who I am and I just haven't had the strength and the guidance to achieve it? We could argue about this forever, but the bosses I remember and the one with the most fondness are the ones that helped me discover that I had more in me than I realized and that my bar line and potential is higher than than I was letting myself uh, operate at. It's it's one of the things that I think is toughest for some early stage leaders in the MSP space. Like perfect example is I became an MSP owner because it was 2001 and the company I worked for got bit by the dot-com bug, went from eight to 52, back down to eight. And our CEO told me and my, what became my partner, Frank Jacino, that they couldn't pay us come next Friday. Well, the key though was I never had management experience. So it was tough for me to know where my gaps were, what I wanted my culture to be, because I was still learning the game at that point in time and how it actually played out. And it took years of work getting better. But then I'd even say, I don't think we got better until we actually got merged in with another organization and brought in some other leaders who had experienced more and were able to share that piece. And if you're open, receptive, and humble, you can, you can learn how to adjust to the, what the needs are. And to your point, you can get some of the best feedback from leaders that aren't necessarily your best friends, but they have some perspective that you don't see that helps you understand, Oh, that's really what this is about and how we can drive it forward. It's funny. It's kind of almost you're agreeing to a culture of being honest and candid. And if I have your honest best interest at heart, then I can truthfully tell you where things are falling short. And you know that I'm there to coach and try and help you. If you don't, if we don't have that trust and that honesty and that cultural peace between us, even if I'm bringing up something that will benefit you, if you don't trust me, you're not going to listen to me. So as a leader, I will say that's probably one of the first things you need to develop. You need to make sure that those around you know that your intent is truly to help them succeed at a higher level. Um, And that's critical. Um, Otherwise, you don't get the permission from them to help them, to coach them, to raise their performance and point out the things that are holding them back. They won't trust you. No, that's well said. You know, that is in a nutshell what I think leaders have to think about is, is the trust there. And trust should be one of the core values, I think, in any culture without me going out on a limb. You know, how you define it, how it melds in is is up to you. And trust is also what, you know, very quietly drives performance. Because if everybody trusts one another, there's not as much questioning going on about the actions that are having. And, you know, the title of this was Elevating Your Earnings. And you elevate your earnings by having good people that understand their roles, that are empowered to drive themselves forward and drive the business forward. And they know exactly how to do that. And the outcomes be we're hitting our targets and we're hitting our goals, which elevate our responsibilities. And it all starts with Clear communication, which I think is one of the biggest things that destroys many companies and destroys culture when they feel that that there's not, you know, you don't have to be fully transparent to the end of opening up your books to everybody, right? But help people understand where things really are, good and bad. Yeah, I I think going back to what you said, trust, we could say trust, clarity and communication, your intent as a leader, being consistent, you know, continual. All those things are drivers and you get to decide a bit about which how you want to embrace it. But at the end of the day, you cannot achieve consistent high performance without consistent accountability and results. It just can't. Amazing. Amazing. So, um, you know, I know we're getting towards, um, you know, the the point of opening up some Q&A. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share Dan, before we, and folks, if you do want to start putting any questions that you might have for Dan into the Q&A area, certainly uh, we'll get to those in a moment, but any closing thoughts that you'd like to share, Dan? I think, I think we'll th- we've been talking about management and accountability. It's a couple thoughts to talk about that. I know as we're growing and most of us come from a technical background. And so confidence in our leadership, confidence in who we are, we're stronger. If you tell us to do a technical process, we're pretty strong and we can, we can, we, you know, confidently do it. But when it comes to leading, it takes practice too. I don't know how many workstations and servers and migrations you have to do before you feel confident, but it's more than one or two. Most of us, when it comes to leadership, you've got to get 
iterations in to become strong in that too. And so in, in building those leadership chops, one of the things that I'd, I'd recommend there is if you're the one directly leading, then you need to figure out what that cadence is and, and, and drive that. If you have someone underneath you who's a manager, um, you just pushing on them to deliver a result and then expecting they're going to articulate it and explain it to all their team members so they understand it. Um, it doesn't happen. So it's important, I feel, to be transparent through the whole organization with everybody present um, from, the, from the bottom to the top and explain these are the key drivers. This is what the manager is responsible for doing. So then when the manager is asking for it or beating the drum and holding the cadence, it's not an us versus them between you, the leader at the top, and the people at the bottom between that manager that everybody sees as transparent. It's just how we operate. So you're not putting that manager in a bad spot. That is critical. I see that time and time again. The manager will try and play, well, the leadership wants me to do this, guys, but I'm kind of here for you. And that creates a culture problem that we're trying to avoid. We want to make sure that it's uniform across the whole organization. Everyone knows this is what we all do and this is why. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that clarity cannot be underestimated and it drives so much of what's going on uh, you know, within the business and certainly drives the success. Um, I'm going to throw out to you, Dan, it looks like we've got a question that came in. Uh, Jeff is asking, for smaller MSPs, it's difficult to swap out C players for A and B players, especially in an environment where there's a negative unemployment rate, right? And you know, we all know it's tough to find resources right now. Yeah, no yeah. oh what. yeah, right. Yeah, so, you know, I see the only solution is either merging with another MSP that would provide more opportunities to move employees in there out of the organization. Can you comment on the concept of grow or die? <laughs> well, there were so many little snippets in there. I feel your pain. So let, let's talk about, and we go back to that slide about what that cadence does for a C player. If we don't manage a C player, then they're going to vacillate everywhere. So at a minimum, the first thing we need to do is, is set very clear your time's in on a daily basis, that we don't put time into these categories that don't add value, right? Or we make sure we're utilizing the time in the most effective way and we're driving it daily because if the time's gone in a day, you never get that time back, yeah. right? So for, for our C players, and if you're the one managing on a small team, you've got to drive that consistently until you're able to scale and have someone else who is going to do it. And by the way, don't just hand it off to somebody excuse me, and hope they do it, you hand that off and they need to be doing it. A lot of companies, when they scale to that first or second manager, they lose efficiency because that person, that manager is not driving the results they need to. They're kind of taking that lackadaisical, not managing to a result. So you can get and succeed and have a lot of progress and you need to, you're going to have to succeed with C players, but that's how you could drive that. Now, meanwhile, keep interviewing. Keep interviewing and don't be afraid to top grade. I know that's a cold feeling for some people, but let's think about fantasy sports for a second. I need people to contribute to my points roster. And at some point I need to make a decision if I've got a more reliable, stable contributor than someone who's fluctuating. Fluctuating kills us. And I know we're talking about people, but in truth, we're talking about your business too and what you tolerate and what you're going to accept. And so as you're driving accountability, it's a good thing for you to practice. Keep looking, keep because you will find people. Dan, how do you feel about kind of that? Some employees can vacillate between ratings too, right? Yeah. You can have somebody that was consistently an A or a B player, but then they hit a certain point in the fantasy football uh, you know, analogy kind of threw this one into my head where, you know, they're, they're a performer and we tend to fall in love with them because of their past history, but not what they're actually doing today. Right. And not where their performance is now. You know, similarly, I look at C players and to your point, you've got to give them direction. You've got to put some harness around it, but sometimes they just haven't had enough experience yet to become the B player. And I see that when you give them 
you know, what you were speaking of, you know, some of those reins and, you know, and um, railings that they can stay within, they all of a sudden find themselves elevating to a B because they just didn't know what the path was to get there, right? So, you know, when in your question, Jeff, when I think of it that way, I, I think it really comes down to look at your environment, look at your people and say, am I really doing the very best I can for those C performers to potentially become B performers. And then looking the other way around, as Dan was saying, and then don't be afraid to top grade, but it doesn't have, have to happen overnight. You know, just keep interviewing as a part of your natural course of action. You know, I, I have interviewed at least one or two people a month, even when I'm not hiring to see if there's just somebody great out there that's available at this point in time. And then I have a gut check moment, right? Do I suck it up and make a decision of go or do I not? But you know, when you see a superstar, you see somebody that's going to fit your culture. Well, it'd be a shame to miss out too. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's a, an important thing to do to add back to the, the comment here though. It's I've also found that C players often there's two or three things they're doing that are really hurting you in those bad C areas and being open and honest and explaining how they hurt and why they hurt. If the C player is someone who is a good person and they want to contribute, often they don't know. They're just assuming they're working hard. They don't understand the difference. You run a business, you own a business or whatever, and you understand more than they do. You actually saying, hey, when you do X or when you don't do X, whatever it is, you have to understand this is how it really hurts us. And I need you to understand how you're hurting us. That's a great indicator and a teacher for you to know if this is somebody who has more potential but just doesn't know or they don't care. Because if you explain these pain points to someone who doesn't care, you're going to know pretty quick and you're going to know you need to move on fast. If they do care and they do commit, you know, you know what, I'm going to make sure I capture those two hours um, every day that I'm kind of letting slip. Now you can raise and have higher success. How about the comment about that Jeff put in here about grow or die? Because that's a very big topic that we hear about. Certainly, you know, when I have Abe Garver join me on some of these meetings, uh, you know, he'll talk about, you know, the, the M&A world. And there's a lot of pressure sometimes on grow or die out there for people to make decisions. But I also say you have to look at your own personal culture then at that point and say, well, what does grow really mean to me? Is grow going to actually mean what I want? Um, you know, what, what I want out of this business will expand or am I growing just for vanity purposes? Right. And really I'm happy where I am. And then there is that feeling of though, if we don't grow it to some degree, can I be exposed if something changes my da dynamic, a customer leaves something like that, that then will make it much more difficult. I, I mean, you, yeah, you, you bring up several points there. I think growth for growth's sake is always a scary thing. Ideally, it's intentional and you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, the scary thing, and, and, and this, is, this is for all of us, um, doesn't matter if you're a, a five, six person company, a 12 person company, a 20 person company, 40, eight, whatever like this, there's always a bigger fish out there or a market condition that can change. And so we are in a spot where we don't have 100% predictability. But the thing we do know is if you know how to add value to a business, there's opportunity for you there. Um, is it going to be the exact same thing that you have now? I, I, nobody knows. But you have that unique, strong skill set and willingness to, to do that. Um, grow or die is is when I look at it, I think what you're saying, Brian, is really key. Some of us don't want to be or have the responsibility or live the life, meaning leadership wise, required to, to operate a larger organization. You, what works at five or six people starts to hold you back at about 10, 12 people, and then will not let you really move beyond much until you change. And that's all about you changing. And that's a hard thing to give up. So if you're like in that five, six or 12 range, and let's say you're the main technical person, you own the company, you're a main tech, you kind of have to give that all up if you're going to move on. And if you yeah. find a lot of joy and quality of life of being the one that solves the big technical problems, then, then that's kind of hard to give up. And so just moving on to grow, you know, is painful. Now, that being said, if you want to be the technical side and you find someone like Brian who loves the sales and the relationship side, then you two could have a strong marriage working relationship where you could help each other with your respective spheres and create something greater. Yeah. But 
part of it is, is kind of knowing who you are and what you enjoy the most. Um, because if you're the only one scaling, you have to change who you are multiple times to get there. Yeah. So, you know, obviously I don't, I, unfortunately, Jeff, we probably won't be able to answer your question in full as we only have part of the information and thank you for sharing what you did in inside of there. But I think I would, Dan is really talking about is key. It's gut check moments. It's can I, you know, first you have the belief you can carry it further. Second, what am I missing? And can I go out and get that? Or can I find a way to merge it? You know, the old one plus one equals three concept that, uh, that you were talking about a little bit there, Dan, I was blessed, you know, when we started our MSP, I was the business side, my, uh, my partner was the technical side. And we knew that going into that relationship. So it made it very easy for us to comfortably stay in the lanes that we occupied and then come together to, you know, to share mind share, to try to grow that, um, that organization. And, you know, th you, you've got to find those complementary skill sets if that's your objective to grow. And then it's just a question of how fast you grow, what growth really means to you is growth a, you know, hockey stick growth, or is it just a nice, you know, level line of growth year over year, a few new people coming in and managing a culture that you love going to every day. Yeah. I, you, there's there's so many variables like we are humans in 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 what success is and what you want and you can win it's not just about growing to a size to sell i mean you can make a, a very successful life for yourself instead of dumping the money back into the business staying in a smaller side but then pocketing that extra amount and just investing it over you know 10 15 years you can build up a, a decent nest egg that that is that'll help you through retirement as well so there's different ways to accomplish success probably a little bit less stress than what you just defined right there dan because you're in control of the equation and you're not just waiting to see what somebody's going to offer you at the end of the rainbow there's, 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 there's nothing worse than rolling everything into a big snowball and realizing the snowball just broke and it's not going to be worth anything so yeah, yeah. There's, there's stress on you know different ways all right um well we're getting near the top of the hour i'll, I'll open up q a for anybody else that might have another question that they want to put in there but maybe in the meantime dan tell people how they can get in touch with you um so they can reach uh, up skill.com in fact if i were gonna uh, well you can pop yeah, it please up feel yeah well no well, feel free to bring it up i'll i can bring it up on my end keep but, going but yeah so so basically upskill uh, up-skill.com or dadams at up-skill.com is a great way to, to get a hold of me. Um, and there we have educational content. Um, we've got a book out that helps teach people about the basics of, of how it's not just about technology, it's about business and how to find success. So so basically, yeah, so you see me again there as we as we scroll, but it's a great way for you to, to reach out and educate your team. Our goal here is to raise the performance and professionalism and customer service level of, of all service people, which helps their careers, but then helps business teams uh, and, and business owners have greater success. Terrific. So, anyway. All right, Dan. Well, I think uh, at this point, it looks like questions and answers. We've, we've received what we're going to get in here. I want to thank you for joining me on you know the latest installment of our learning series. Again, it's it's fun for me to get people to talk about different subjects that I don't live day in, day out, but this isn't about just serving me. It's about serving others. And I'm sure a lot of folks came away with at least one tidbit that they can work on uh, going forward. And that's usually our goal, right? Find one area you can improve every day. So Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. For those that joined us as well, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come listen to what we have to say and share some time with us as well. If you have any other questions for Dan, as he mentioned, you can reach him right over here at, I think it was Dan, or D Adams at ups-skill.com. Yep. That's and correct. we'll certainly put that in the follow-up video for you. If you've got any questions for me, as most of you know, you can hit me at B Doyle at BCIO Toolbox. And I want to wish everybody a great rest of their day. Thanks. Thank Brian. you, Dan. Appreciate it. You bet.